Have you suffered the loss of a loved one or experienced the pain of betrayal at the highest level? Do you feel like God wasn't there or doesn't care? What are our biblical expectations for dealing with such things? That's what we're here to talk about. In the last episode, we looked into our biblical expectations for God. In this episode, we will study our biblical expectations for prayer. Ken, it's good to see you again. You too, brother. I wanted to try and just keep today really simple um, because I want prayer to be able to be something that is just heartfelt. And I, I thought it would be easiest for us to just look at one passage. So for those Wait, that are listening along, this has to be some sort of record. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> we might we might reference some other passages. But okay, okay, we just want to go in order <laughs> because there is a passage in the Bible that Jesus gives us that tells us all about this. And so I see no better place to go than, than from the words of Jesus himself. Amen. And in Matthew chapter six, we'll start in verse number five. So um, that we're really going to, we're going to build upon um, the flow of Jesus's thought. We want to understand his flow of thought. So <clears throat> those that are listening along, if they want to grab their Bibles, this would be a good time to, to see it. I know you put the verses on the screen, but to be able to see it, locate this in your own, in your own Bible and make this your own. So in Matthew chapter six, verses one through four, of course, let me back up for a second. We're in the, we're in the, the section that we call the Sermon on the Mount, which Matthew has topically put together um, some conversations that Jesus has. We know, we know from other passages that this wasn't all said at one time, but Matthew topically puts things together. Um, you can tell that from the way that Luke records this. But in verses 1 through 4, this is the Sermon on the Mount, largely Jesus is giving instruction on how he wants his kingdom to run. By the time we get to chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, he gives some principles on giving. We're not going to look at that in this session because we're going to be focusing on prayer. But in verse number five, verses five through eight, he gives instructions for prayer. And I'm going to, I created a little handout for this just for ease of, of uh, following along. So I'm going to read from our handout. And um, I believe, Jimmy, you'll, you'll probably have the, the link for this in the description. Is that right? That's right. I will. Okay, perfect. So let's go ahead and look at verse five together. And then we'll make a couple comments that are on the handout. Jesus says, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask of him. So that section right there uh, is just some instructions for prayer. Um, and I wanted to just highlight a couple of those, and uh, we'll just go through these first uh, verses 5 through 8 before we get into a sample prayer that Jesus gives us. And uh, I'll tell you why I'm calling it that when we get there. But in verse number 5, he says, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. This word hypocrites in the Greek literally is talking about uh, a stage actor. That's what the word means. So he's saying, don't be an actor. You know, sometimes when we get on the topic of faith and salvation, you know, some, some people will say, well, you know, where, where do, and I don't want to rabbit trail too far. That's why I'm trying to measure my words here. People say, well, where do works play into this? A lot like we talked about in the salvation shelter. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll say, well, are you saying it's just belief? and I don't have to do anything. You know, somebody will say something like that. It's just, just belief. Well, the Bible defines faith as a faith that works. You know, it's, it's not a dead faith. 
it's a living faith. And a living faith has uh, byproducts. And that byproduct of a living faith is obedience. So, you know, yes, faith is the mechanism by faith, th- through by grace through faith. Um, so a hypocrite is somebody who's, who's an actor. They say they believe, you know, they, they, they say they have faith, but they really, they're really saying that they're aware of something, but their lives don't back it up. So they're acting. That's what the word hypocrites mean. Well, an actor is doing it for the perception of other people. They're doing it for others to think a certain way of them. And so in verse number five, Jesus is saying to not be an actor. Be, In other words, be authentic in our prayers. There are some people who their whole agenda with their prayer is is to be seen of other people. So we have these a couple characteristics. One is is they, they want to be seen of other people so they can be considered spiritual. And the second one is uh, another characteristic of this type of person is that they, they will be rewarded immediately, but not of God. Their reward is, is a pat on the back from other people. And so they're immediately rewarded. So let's kind of, I just like to tease out these passages and get some, and get principles out of them. So, Another principle, Jimmy, I could say from verse number five is not only should we be authentic in our prayer, which is I'm having a conversation with the creator of the universe. So I, you know, I, I really don't need an audience other than him. But another characteristic I can pull out of verse five, if, if you just look at it and see where I'm coming from on this, is I can have a long term expectation of reward. In other words, I I know that I'm trying to align my hearts with the will of God, and, and and the answer to my prayer may not come for a very long time. It's a can I say it this way? It's a delayed reward. Authentic prayer. Uh, one of the expectations is a delayed reward, whereas the expectation of an of a stage actor is an immediate reward. You know, you get a, you get a round of applause when you're a stage actor, you get immediate feedback. In fact, um, this, wow. I just randomly thought of this. This is so weird. I just thought of this, but, um, yeah, I'll give you an illustration because it just popped in my head. I happened to see this the other day. So the kind of funny, um, I'm sure most people that are watching this are familiar with the name of, uh, Rodney Dangerfield. He's a comedian that, um, throughout the seventies and eighties, he got he, no, he respect. Gets no respect. Yeah. He gets no respect. Yeah, no exactly. Respect. <laughs> no respect. I tell you, <laughs> you know, that and, was good. Um, so <laughs> that yeah, was thank good. you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of my many talents is impressions, but, um, uh, but <laughs> Rodney gets no respect, never did whatever. And that's what he was famous for. Well, he was on a movie called Caddyshack. I'm not sure if I've ever seen it, but it was a famous movie. And, um, I just happened to see this other day. It's perfect for what we're talking about. Rodney Dangerfield, when he was on that, he was, that was his first, I think that was his first movie. And when he was on it, um, he was given his lines and he came in and he was nervous as could be. He would ask everybody, where am I supposed to stand? What am I supposed to do? And when he came in and they were rolling and he delivered his lines in the movie, the people that he was looking at in real life, the actors there, they didn't laugh. And so Rodney quit on the scene and they said, what, what are you doing? And he went to the director. He said, I'm, I'm, bom- I'm bombing. They, they hate it. And he said, no, Rodney, <laughs> part of the movie is they're not supposed to laugh. He said, yeah, but nobody, nobody's laughing. And they said, no, everybody's supposed to be quiet. This is a movie set. And he was like, well, I, but the material's not going over well. Nobody's even responding. And they tried to get him to know they're holding in their laughter that this is part of the movie is they're not going to ever respond to anything you say. He's like, well, it's just deadpan and it's not even good. And they had to try and rewire Rodney's brain to know, no, you're doing well. Cause he was so, in, he was so insecure. He thought if nobody's responding, then he's failing as a comedian because his whole life he'd been in front of people on a stage and you get an, an immediate response. 
And when you say a joke on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, you get an immediate response from the crowd and you hear that applause and that laughter and that feedback and that tells you, okay, that joke landed. Well, you know, and you know this as a musician, could you imagine, you know, pressing on the keys and there's some, some of the keys work, some of the keys don't like, well, did I not push hard enough? What is this thing not on? What's going on here? Um, maybe a better example would be if you're playing actually a piano, you know, and, and you're pushing down and just like the hammer's not hitting all the way on the string and you're well, is there something wrong here? That would just be, you couldn't just keep on playing. You'd just stop, you know? And I think that's where Rodney was at when he was recording. Well, if you're constantly used to hearing feedback, immediate feedback, and then all of a sudden you start praying in private and there's no feedback, you're going to feel like there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. The actor, the hypocrite, that's the stage actor. Think of that as the Rodney in front of people in the Tonight Show. They have their reward. Their reward is immediate and it's in front of people. But they're, this, and this is why it's a faith position when we're praying in, in our closet. Because there's no feedback. And Jesus is just reassuring those that are following him and saying, it's okay, you're not going to hear clapping. When you pray don't pray standing in a public place to be seen of people in other words there is a humility um in prayer there is a there is a, an expectation of 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 delayed gratification with prayer look at verse number six he says but thou meaning the fought his followers when thou prayest, enter to thy closet and when thou hast shut thy door pray to thy father which is in secret and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So a couple of, couple of principles here. Pray to the Lord directly to be heard and seen of him alone. I have this number two on the handout. A couple characteristics of this. <clears throat> a, I have on there. Speak to the Lord in a quiet and private place. B, the Lord will respond in a public way. Now, this requires us to really buy into this idea because us as human beings— I want to have immediate, at least give me, Lord, at least give me a feeling of success. People say, I didn't feel anything. I just don't feel anything. Folks, we don't, we don't go by that. We don't go by feeling. We go by truth. And that's why reading the word of God is so important. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's faith, not feeling. Well, and even- It doesn't say without even when it says walk by faith, not by sight, that's even kind of the same kind of thing, right? Sure. Yeah. We could even say it this way. Walk, walk by immaterial, not by material. Walk by spiritual, not by physical. Walk by faith, not by sight. Um, exactly. And so, you know, the Bible doesn't say without feelings it's impossible to please God. It's without faith. Mm -hmm. I, I, I highly doubt, you know, Jesus had warm and fuzzy feelings in the garden of Gethsemane. No, he was terrified. He was filled with sorrow, even on a death. Hmm. Um, so it's not by feeling. And I think we, we all are guilty of the stage actor idea where we want immediate feedback. I want to hear something immediately. And when that doesn't come, it's like, well, you know, he's forsaken me. No, it's just you have an audience of one, and this audience has heard you, and he doesn't respond like people respond. He's not fickle. It's kind of the difference between, I heard my, my youth pastor when I was in high school preached a sermon, and it was, it was honestly life-changing. It was on a Wednesday with probably you know 30 people there, and he would never have imagined that it would shape my life. But I remember this sermon to this day. I think of it all the time. And it was called launch, launch out into the deep was the idea. And the whole point of the sermon was that there are two parts to the water. There's the shallows and then there's the deep. In the shallows, you have people playing volleyball. You have, you know, jet skis. You have um, people s splashing each other and there's laughter and there's commotion and, and there's beach balls and there's sand castles and there's hot dog vendors and there's picnics being had. And all this is all in the shallows. Lots of uh, sounds and excitement and feedback and fun. and But out in the deep are where wars are won. And out in the deep, you just have that, you just have that ship by itself where they're in trouble if the ship goes down. 
and the ship is just trudging just with its engine. It's all you hear. But that's where the world has changed in the deep. The, the shallows don't change anything. And our prayer life is a lot like that. The Lord is saying, hey, why don't you come out in the deep? And you're like, but Lord, if I fall off the boat there, I, I die. He's like, yeah, that's what I want. I want total submission. I want total reliance where you get very little feedback, if any, for a long, long time. And things are serious out here. And there's no feelings involved and there's no feedback from other people. That's what he's talking about when he says in verse six, enter into your closet, shut your door. But, but this is the principle we have to buy into. When you pray in secret, when you're out in the deep, it, it affects the people in the shallows. I'll reward you openly. You say, well, Ken, how long does that take? I don't know. I don't know. But that's where faith comes in. Go into your closet where nobody can see. And then when you go out your door, you have the armor of God on and you go face your community and you know that you're, as we say, prayed up and you're waiting for him to affect things on an external basis. But I don't know <clears throat> how long that'll take. That's part of following him. In verse seven, he says, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. They think they'll be heard for their much speaking. I have on the handout here, prayer's not a work, but rather a conversation. Yeah, I have the illustration here. You wouldn't, you wouldn't go to a friend. You imagine if, if you came to my house, Jimmy, and you wanted to, you wanted to express something to me, and you, and you sat down in my living room, and you said, oh, well, Ken, um, <clears throat> you know, I just really feel like you know, we should go to the store today and, uh, and get some food. And I said, oh, okay, well, you know, yeah, no problem. We can, we can do that. And you said, Ken, I really feel like we should go to the store today and get some food. I go, yeah, man. I mean, sure. Ken, I really feel like we should go to the store today and get some food. I go, dude, gotcha. Yeah, let's go do it. I gotcha. Ken, I really feel like we should go to the store today and get some food. I'd be like, bro, but I'm like, yeah, I'm with you. Ken, I really feel like we should go to the store today and get some food. I'd be like, are you okay? You would never go to your friend and do that. Uh, that would be considered losing your mind. Mm -hmm. we, would, we would call that person crazy. Why are you repeating yourself? I, I heard you. But yet there is, you know, things like the rosary, things like the, you know, Hail Mary, you know, do, do this many Hail Marys, you know, that kind of thing. And And there are people that may not be Roman Catholic, but still buy into the idea of, um, if, if I say these words enough, he will certainly have to hear me. In other words, can I say it this way? Um, they believe that they will be rewarded for their work. They believe there's, there's a wage that God will, if I, if I say the same words enough, he owes it. He owes me. I'm earning it. It's my job to say these words in the same exact way every time. And now he's indebted to me because I've taken the time to do that. Like, in other words, when we go into prayer, we should not view it as, okay, I'm going to work right now. And you know what? He owes me. I took the time to do that. You may not say the same words every time, but if your understanding of prayer is I'm going to invest of myself in the system of karma, I'm going to invest in myself in the system of spirituality. And I know that that means payday is coming. God owes me because I've done this, this, this work, this deed. And the idea of being heard is the idea of the Lord responding to our prayer and, and basically obeying us because he owes us. And that's why I have as number three, prayer's not a work. You're not, you're not expecting a wage from it, but rather it's a conversation. So uh, maybe this is also a good point from verse number seven. They believe they'll be heard for their much speaking. And uh, maybe we could just say this at this point. Every prayer is heard. And every prayer is answered. You know, we talked to, I, that's always bugged me. 
sometimes we'll take a moment and say, Hey, you know, I, I got, I got an answer to my prayer. I got answered prayer. Well, folks, every prayer is answered. When we say that we're, we're so selfish or so self-centered that when I, when I say I got an answer to my prayer, what I really mean is I got the answer I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> You know, if my kids come to me when they're really little and they ask if they can go do a sleepover and I say no, how would you, let me ask this, how would you feel if you're raising a child and they come to you and say, can I go do a sleepover? And you say, no, not tonight. And they say, well, can I ask why? And you give them, you, you can either say, because I said so, or you could say, because of these reasons here, whatever, whatever your parenting style is. And, um, and you give them the answer. The answer is no, this time it's no. Okay. Now, the response should be, yes, sir, and that's that. But you follow them. They go across the street, and you have your ear up, and they say to their friend, did you, did you ask your dad if you could come over? And they say, I didn't get an answer yet. And so they ask the next weekend, and you say, no, I didn't get an answer yet. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you did. And they do this 10 times in a row. And finally the schedule works out and they've been, you know, they've, they've been obedient, whatever. And you say, you know what, that'd be fine. I, I, you can go do the sleepover. And they go over and they said, great news. He finally answered. Mm. I got an answer to my question. You got an answer every time, but we're just like that little bratty child. I'll just say, Ken, I'm just going to talk about me. Sometimes I'm like that little bratty child. Cause I know nobody wants that illustration to apply to them. So I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Even though I think it's everybody, but we'll just, <laughs> I'm like that bratty child sometimes where I am saying I didn't get an answer to prayer and the Lord's going, huh? But when it finally goes Ken's way, I say, I got an answer to prayer. So we can't think that way. That That's a, that's a heathenistic way of thinking about prayer. This, this isn't quite the way you just said it, but I, I have heard somebody say this one time and it made a lot of sense to me. They said, God answers your prayers every time, but he all, but He answers them in a way that if you knew as much as he did, you would have asked it <laughs> maybe a different way. <laughs> but uh, I totally butchered that, but you kind of get my point. Right. We, if, sure, sure. Every prayer is getting answered, but, but it also our perception of it is based on how we've I guess ask it with our limited knowledge, yeah. you know, we don't, sure. we don't see yeah. the big picture. It's like, like you said in one of our last episodes about uh, puzzle pieces that, that really stuck with me. Right. The puzzle pieces. Yeah. Right? That's, that's a helpful one for me too. Yeah. Um, uh, I have in the handout on B letter B you'll be heard because he loves you. Not because he owes you for your hard work in prayer. Mm -hmm. So, it's a very important concept. This is, as you can tell as we're going through here, Jesus is really emphasizing the relationship that he would desires to have. This is relationship. This is not religion. You know, this well, is not a religious exercise. It's, it's, it's a relationship. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the handout uh, that will be in the links below for people to, to get if they want. But um, I'm interested to see where you go with the conversation. You said it's a it, it's a conversation, and I see your where you're going here in a minute of a dialogue. Because yes. you know, I see all these, and I know we've all seen them. All these big tele evangelists and stuff. They're always talking about, and I said, God, how come this? And He goes, because of this, and this is what, and this is what I want you to do, mm -hmm. and I want you to go get that. And well, I can't do that. I mean. That's what I think about when I have a conversation, but it's almost like I've never had that with right. with God. I mean, am I missing something? Am I, you know? So I, I just can't wait to see where you uh, where you kind of go with that. Yeah, perfect, perfect segue. Let's go to verse eight. So he says, "Be be not ye therefore like unto them." He's talking about the heathen. This this concept of. I've put in my time, give me my wage. I've earned this. So don't, he's saying, don't, don't be like the heathen. Don't, don't approach the prayer that way. And then he says this, this is what's interesting for you for, and that think of the word because when you see the word for, and don't, don't be like them. Okay. Why can't I be like them? Here's the reason why <laughs> for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask of him. Ah, 
So it would why be like, ask him then, right? Yeah, right, right, right. And that's that's and that's and that's what he's answering. That's what he's answering. So it'd be like you already heard your child say they want to go over to their friend's house. You could you could hear them already talking. You already knew when they they you know they're gonna they're gonna ask you if they can do the sleepover. You're already aware of what they want to do. You can easily understand that situation. So they come out and they say, "Hey, Dad," and you're like, "Hey, how's it going?" They say, first of all." love that shirt you're wearing today and you're like thanks hey do you can i go out and wash your car for you would that be okay just love you and you're like no i already got it washed yesterday but thanks though and they're like okay just you know whatever i can do you know and you just see that little manipulation start you know th- this is the thinking that that the lord is trying to say I, you know, and I, and I always say this to, you know, to people that I love a lot. I, I love people when, when I'm, you know, trying to, to, to save a relationship or gain a relationship or whatever the case is. I, I care enough about people that I love to be authentic with them, even if at times it's uncomfortable. I'm not interested in fake relationships. I just, it doesn't appeal to me. Um, I don't, I'm not drawn to that. I don't care about my social circle. I don't care about being fake in a way that the masses will like me, I guess. It just doesn't, I don't, it just doesn't appeal to me. I'd rather have a few authentic relationships than thousand fake ones. I just, that's just, that's just my personality. Um, And I think that in verse eight, the Lord is saying here, okay, let's, let's, let's understand this. I, I, prayer is not for you to inform me of anything. I already know. So you're not you're not making me aware of a situation when you pray. Okay. Well, well what does that mean in my approach to him? So why pray, right? And that's kind of what you were asking. What's the point? Well, there is no point in prayer if the goal of prayer is to inform him. If that's the goal, then there's no point. But that's not the goal. So there is a point. And that's what verse eight is, is really taking off the table. And when people struggle with that, well, why, why am I praying? Well, that, if you struggle with that, that's because you believe the premise is to inform God. And that's not the point of prayer. So, so Jesus is helping us to understand this in verse eight. It's not intended to inform God I have in our handout, but rather it's to begin a dialogue with God in order to, align our thinking with his that's 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 really the point of prayer and so he says be be not like the heathen for your for your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask of him in other words he's saying i want to hear your voice you know sometimes when if sarah and i have been apart from each other all day for whatever reason i just want to hear how her day went you know tell me the things that were frustrating today said tell me the things that were funny today you know we we love to laugh on things that have happened in in the day and that that kind of thing same thing with my children you know tell me how how, how's your week going tell me everything i want these details now sometimes i'll hear the same story from i have three kids so i hear hear the same story from one kid and then the next kid's like oh man this this thing happened and i've already heard it so if, if if drew already tells me a funny story and and then lauren or caitlin come up and say Oh, this funny thing happened. You think I'd go stop? I, I already, I already heard it. No, I want to hear how they say it. Why? Because I absolutely am in life with them, and I am interested to hear how they word it. It's not for information, right? For relationship. He's my father. I'm his son. He wants to hear how I'm going to say it not that he doesn't know but and it's and it's also because i i also want to teach my children how to tell stories how to communicate i i'm i'm teaching them life lessons at that point now we don't think of it that way it's just some silly story right but think about every conversation you have with your dad he's helping you to learn so i already know the story but if one of my children say a story i already know then i can ask questions back to them you know, oh, then, then what did they say? Because I know they said something. So then what did they say? Oh, th- that's the funny part. I forgot about that. They said this. <clears throat> oh, my, my goodness. Well, has that ever happened before? No, and, and so we're in a dialogue. They're learning how to 
come in line with the personality of their father. Kids that can kids that can have dialogue with their father are more successful in life. We we know from studies that um, our sense. Of, well, let me say it this way: um, a, a young boy uh, in, in counseling, I can almost tell what this is when I'm talking to the folks. If it's a man, he gains his confidence from his father. Okay. So if I'm dealing with a man who's in his fifties, sixties or whatever, younger, older, and he's dealing with confidence issues, he's second guessing himself. I know nine times out of 10, his relationship with his dad was in such a way where he didn't gain that confidence from the, the years of his life where he should have already had it. Like his, you know, his years growing up, in, even preteen, he didn't get a self, uh, an idea of self-confidence from his father, probably in those years, something happened. We want, we need to be able to figure that out for, for the female, for a, for a lady, they gain their sense of security from their dad. So if there's a constant, if, if I'm hearing their story, and there's a constant uncertainty from a, from a woman. And there's a constant, I, I, I'm just not, I don't know if this is going to last or what's the point if this will, this won't last. They're, they're talking about things in insecurity. I know more than likely nine times out of 10 what, during their, their formative years, there was a lack of a, of a comfortable, thriving, uh, a vibrant relationship with their father. Or they tried to have one, but he was unable to, whether there was alcoholism or whatever the case is, he was, maybe there's a divorce. There's something that they're missing that link of knowing, Hey, I don't struggle with security. I'm good. But if they're missing that more than likely, that probably is the case. Okay. So, so, so knowing that that's knowing that that's the case, why does God want you to talk to him for all the reasons I just said? So you can feel secure. So you can be confident. I talked to God this morning. He's not, like we've said, he's not my genie. He's not my butler. He's not my wishing well. He's my father in heaven that knows everything and can do anything. I talked to him. I'm connected with him. So, so this dialogue so, and you can see, you know, imagine if we talked like this every day, imagine if we had this conversation of prayer every day and you got a healthy, healthy, just biblical dose of this concept we're talking about. And then somebody comes to you in a year and says, what's the point of prayer? If, if God already knows you'd go, Oh, sit down and let me tell you. Hmm. I mean, my confidence has gone through the roof from telling God things he already knows. Now you don't, you're, you, you're missing it. It's not to inform, it's, it's, it's to align my thinking with his. I am so confident because I have access to the God of heaven. You know, so, so now Jesus in verse nine is going to switch a little bit and he's going to give us a sample prayer. Not, and that's what I, that's why I wanted to go to this section. So there's expectations really, or instructions, however you want to word that from verses five through eight. And we could really tease this out. Um, but for the sake of simplicity, let's move on. He's going to now say, okay, those things, those, those principles we just looked at, those instructions from verses um, five through eight, he says, I'm going to show you now how to do this. So in sections of nine through 13 is often, Jimmy, what we hear referred to as the Lord's Prayer. Now, I don't call it the Lord's Prayer because it's his sample prayer. This is not a prayer that Jesus was praying right? because he's asking for forgiveness. Jesus has no reason to ask for forgiveness. So this is, I think, improperly named the Lord's Prayer. It should be called the Lord's Sample Prayer <laughs> or his example prayer or instructions on prayer. This is not Jesus praying. Jesus does not pray for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So this is not the Lord's Prayer. This is his sample prayer for us. So it's an important distinction. But I'm going to go through here. Let's go ahead and just read it, and then we'll come back through and just and just kind of what I'm going to do in this is very simple. I'm just going to go through, and then I'm going to explain it word by word, phrase by phrase. And then at the very end, when you can see this where we're going in your handout, I have five 
general guidelines for for prayer for us from the, from the sample prayer. So that's where we're headed. Let's go ahead and just read this. 9 through 13. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, this is the sample prayer for us. Let's go back through at the beginning in verse 9 and break this thing down. Notice where I'm getting that from, his sample prayer. He says, after this manner. So that, that's, that's the sample idea. We're supposed to follow in this manner. And I want to point out also that when we see in verse number 9, he says, after this manner, this is a lot different than praying these exact words. He's not saying pray this prayer. He's saying after this manner. In other words, he say, Jesus is basically saying, pray something like this. I've seen and I people think talk directly, about, like, pray, this is, the, this is the importance of the order of it. Like, like, first, pray to God in heaven and worship him, and then ask him for, you know, kind of just what, what the level yes. of importance is. Yes, and that's those are the basically when we when we finish up the video, those five general principles at the end, five general guidelines. That's that's what basically we're just going to kind of organize our prayer. Oh, okay. And, that, and we're going to do that at the end. So exactly yeah. what you're saying. That's so that's going to be our left hook at the end of the video. Is exactly what you're saying is how to generally structure your prayer. Just just so we're hitting all the points Jesus said. But I think this directly goes back to verse seven where he says, "Do not use vain repetitions." He, that's that's exactly what he says. Pray something like this, and, and and after all, isn't that how you would teach your children? You would, you know, hey guys, when you when you want to go to the sleepover or if you're hurting, come to me and tell me, um, tell me what you're thinking. You know, you wouldn't say, hey guys, I'm going to give you a three by five card and I want you to read this to me every time you want to do a sleepover. You know, our father please be aware of our situation. And then they put it down and look at you and see if they said the words, right. Yeah. That's not out of the, as a parent, that's not what I'm after. Yeah. And if, and if, and I've done it many times, I've prayed this exact prayer and, you know, but if it, it, it can become very quickly a vain repetition. Yeah. And that's the point. And I, and I don't think that you're in trouble with the Lord. If you open up your Bible and pray these exact words, right. But I think the point is, like you said, is that it's good to use your own personality and to change the words so that you you don't become re- religious. Jesus came to to um, to bring his kingdom to the earth, not to bring a religion to the earth. Remember, it's the religious people who killed him. It's the, it's the professional Pharisees that hated him. He took their power away because he brought a kingdom. And that, that's actually in the, in this prayer. So let's go ahead and look at this. Uh, and I'm going to break this down. So I, I wanted to have the handout there. So if you have your handout, folks, and you're able to look at it, this might be a good time to pause it and pull that up on your screen because we're going to go kind of just, I have it in bold words here. Um, I didn't make this too academic. This is very, very simple. So let's just go slow. Wait a minute. Could you have okay, made it says, more academic? Is that what you're saying? Oh goodness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I deleted a lot. Actually, I only have a couple references here and there's no Greek. So that, that was hard um, for you, wasn't it? <laughs> you have no idea. So I'm like, <laughs> just be, a, just be practical, Ken. <laughs> so that's, and that's what I want these videos to be. This is not an academic time, but yeah, yeah this, that, this is a great temptation for me for sure. <laughs> so and he says the word hour, let's just go slow here. So hour, let's start, let's just kind of stop there. He's our father, but the word our is a, is a word of plurality. The reason this is important, Jimmy, is because we're part of the, the greatest family, the largest family in the history of the world. I am one of millions and millions, billions of children, and we share the same father. Our father, our plurality. One of the greatest dangers in life 
is to feel alone. When you feel isolated, I, I, folks, please, please hear me on this. When you start feeling like nobody understands you and your problems are unique and you're alone and nobody gets you, you are a breath away from depression. That is the plan of the enemy for your life is to feel alone. Now, all of us have unique stories, but you, but hurt is nobody, nobody has a monopoly on hurt. Nobody has a monopoly on trials. Nobody has a monopoly on pain. You might have a particular unique story, but your human experience is just like mine. Our, we're in this together. We have a family. I am no different than Jimmy. We have, we have different ways we got to our hurt. We have, you know, we're all, we're all unique in the way we got to our hurt. But it's not a contest of who's hurting more. Our, we're, we're a family, we're in this together. Think, think of it, I always think of, of this as the, um, you know, like the National Geographic type of like hunt and predator um, videos. I don't know. Some people can't watch those and see animals attack each other, but I find them fascinating with the hunt and predator stuff. And, you know, because you see a lot of tactics, there's a lot of biblical imagery in the hunt and predator stuff. So if you've never, you know, watched it, you don't want to see an animal eat each other. I get it. But you at least know what I'm talking about. You know, if you see, let's just take the, the common, you know, uh, lion and gazelle, the, the, the classic. And you see the lion, he's just sitting there. The lion knows he can outrun them. The, the lion knows he can um, tear into them and take, take any of them down. Why does he wait? He waits. Because he knows something. He knows there's going to be some straggler that's not going to be paying attention. And he knows that there's this fold, right? This group. And there's going to be one bozo gazelle that's going to go outside the group. And he's going to go, hey, look at that shiny object. And the whole rest of the herd is going to go. And he's still going to be going, oh, cool. Look at that squirrel. Right? Going to be distracted. And he's not going to be in the rest of the group. He's going to be out of the fold for a sheep term shepherding term that's the that's the one the lion's going after the slow one out of the fold our is a big word stay in the fold abide in me and i in you because you know what satan is as a, a, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour he has to find somebody to devour you know who he can devour somebody that's out of the protection of the shepherd He can't just pick and choose who he's going to devour. He has to find someone to devour. And he goes for the ones that's out of the protection of the shepherd. So this is a really important term. We were intended to experience community. Um, the, the church is a plurality of idea, a, a plurality idea. You know, there are people that are trying to make it popular and there always have been pockets of these people that will just badmouth church and badmouth um, groups, you know, don't meet with anybody. I'll tell you right now, you want to fail in your Christian life. Don't get around other believers, be isolated. And that is why I am so, it's so important for me that people have maturity enough to know that, Hey, I can go, I can go worship at a church and not agree with them on everything. That is okay to do. There is a danger. There's a danger of not understanding theological hierarchy. You know, hey, well, guess what? Guess what? Can I just say, to be totally, because this, we're talking about spiritual health right now. Let me just tell you my opinion of this thing. It is not a spiritual gift from God for you to be able to recognize the faults of others. We all can. You're not special. Well, that person believes this, and I saw this one verse, and since they're wrong in that one thing, I will not be a part of that church. Well, that's foolish. That's immature. 
all of us can find faults with each other. That doesn't make you special. It doesn't make you more spiritual. It doesn't make you a stronger follower of Christ. You're like, I see this one thing they're wrong in, and how could you ever follow anybody that thinks that? It's okay. Well, let me ask you now, this, though. Sure. Because I'm I'm falling in this category. I I don't feel like where I'm at, there's a church body that preaches what I believe. And... And I do long to be in fellowship with other believers, but I don't want to sit and hear about a pre-trib rapture and that revelation yeah. is playing out in front of our eyes right now. So yeah. what about that? I well, mean, I think I, I don't want to be continually fed things that I know are not right. Yeah. Gotcha. It, it, that is a struggle. That's real for sure. And I think that if I'm in that position, I know this, that, I, that, that, that that's why I said theological hierarchy. Well, I'm not close I, enough but, to your church to show up there every week. <laughs> oh, we we wish you were. I do too. <laughs> we wish you were. I I well we'll be closer soon, right? One day, yep. Lord Lord willing. Um, but theological hierarchy to me is an important concept, and what that means is, you know, what exactly would it take for you to look at somebody and say, okay, that's heresy. You know, we throw that word around. Most people think the word heresy means I disagree with them biblically. So they're heretical. No, <laughs> folks, it's not what heresy means. Um, and so, and in fact, the word heresy is not even in the Bible. So we have to kind of make up a term. But let me use a, a biblical term, and that's the word antichrist. I think that's, that's the biblical way I think God is trying to teach us about theological hierarchy. Antichrist, this is, uh, Jimmy, this is why it's so dangerous on a practical level to get your eschatology all messed up, like you were just saying, because Antichrist should be a practical um, measurement of, of theological hierarchy, meaning in First John and in Second John, that's the only place that we see the idea of Antichrist mentioned. And the definition is those who deny the teachings of Christ or deny that Christ came in the flesh. Okay. According to the Bible, I believe that is what you break fellowship on. That is the top, that's the top tier theology. Top, that's top tier hierarchy. Right. We have to agree on who Jesus is. Okay. We have to agree that he was virgin born. I'm just going to say what my higher, higher, I'm going to tell you what my top tier is. Everybody has to figure it out for themselves. My top tier, in other words, what I would break fellowship over is that there is a God who oversees creation and he emptied himself and became a man, was born in Bethlehem, that Jesus is the son of God and God emptied himself. He's God himself, born of a virgin, died for our sins and rose again three days later in his body. And he's coming again one day to rule on the earth physically. To me, those are things I break fellowship over. If any part of that is broken, then I I would say that we're straying from the actual gospel. Now, you'll notice in there I didn't say, say anything about timing. Both me and the dispensationalists believe everything I just said. We disagree on timing, but that's not that's second or third tier for me. So uh, we disagree on that. So I think you could sit in a dispensationalist church and you could, it, I'm saying if it's your only option, okay, you have one church in a thousand miles. Okay. That's your only option. Now I, I think you probably have more than that, but I got one uh, on every corner around me. Yeah. I was going to say you're in Tennessee. <laughs> every time. I know more than that. <laughs> so, so I would say your job would be for, first, and I'm saying this not just for Jimmy, but for everybody. Your job would be get a list of churches that you believe agree with your top tier hierarchy of theology, the things you cannot bend on, and then figure out what your second tier is, things that I sure wish they would hit these things as I see them. And then maybe third is, this is kind of a preference. I would understand if they disagree. And fourth is like, yeah, hardly anybody agrees with these, you know, that kind of idea. Try to hit it. You got to get the top tier. You can't have somebody up there that says, Jesus was a good teacher. There's many ways to God. It's either Buddha. Can't do that. 
That's right. we're not in the, we're not even in the same phase. Right. Okay. So top tier's got to be the same. Second would may sure be great if it was the same. You know, but I can understand there's some reasoning differences on those, well, such as eschatology. Well, I guess I've just thought, you know, if I if I grow to really uh, maybe get to know the, the 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 person who teaches, and yeah, I start. Um, maybe I'll start believing something wrong because I start finding trust in this guy. And then I start going against what I already had believed and, and learned uh, just from reading the Bible myself and all the things yeah. we've been learned. So I think that that's probably what has been more of my fear for lack of a better word of, I don't want to go be re-indoctrinated of what I've unlearned. You know what I mean? Does that make any sense? I, I, no, I, it does make sense. And I think that's good to know about yourself. My, my thought on that would be, how did you, you know, how did you come to learn a different position? If you came to learn a different position from the Bible itself, then no one could take you from that. Right. You know, and what I can do is I can, and this is, this is what Paul's talking about being mature in the word. And I, you're probably more mature than you think you are. You're not easily swayed because you've been convinced through the word of God. Now, if it's, if it's convinced because somebody's a really slick speaker and then you hear another slick speaker and you're like, well, they sound right too. Well, then that's not being convinced of the word of God. But if you're convinced by the word of God, then the, the other teacher is going to violate some hermeneutical principle, which is why it's the first video we ever did you know, rules of interpretation. You're going to be able to, now that you know more, that's why it's good to know those rules and say, oh, what this guy's teaching here, he violated rule four. So it might sound good, but he violated rule four to get there, whatever the case is. Okay, and once, well that, you, once you can see it. Well, that leads me to my other reason that, that I don't want to go to another church. I'm not, if I'm sitting here hearing that and I know that it's not right, I, I'm going to be just sitting there shaking my head or I'm going to be, yeah. it's going to be obvious. And, and if sure. somebody, if I talk to somebody at the church, uh, after church or the service, they're like, Oh, wasn't that great. And I can't say, I don't feel that it, that it would be right for me to be sitting in another, uh, yeah. shepherd's, uh, church and a congregation and then behind the scenes be disagreeing with what he just said. And I'm afraid I would do that. And plus, if somebody in one of these dispensational churches asked me what I do, right. and one of the things I do is this video channel, and they go <laughs> right, right. start watching, yeah. then, then right. I could be perceived as being disruptive in this body and uh, coming in and trying to disturb another man's mm -hmm. flock. You know what I mean? So I'm sure. I just, I don't know, well, maybe I'm making too many excuses. I get it. Well, I would, again, again, it's the hierarchy idea, right? So for me, I would say number one step for me, and I talk through this all the time because there's a lot of people who are on their own and they're wondering why they're struggling with things. I'm like, you weren't meant to be on your own. So my step number one, if I'm in your position, what I would do is I would actually write down or make a list of all the churches in your area within, you know, 20 miles or whatever the case is that you think agree with you on your, in your top tier hierarchy. But Jimmy, most people have never even thought through that part. Right. They don't even know what they don't even know what they're, that's why I'm saying the hierarchy thing. Cause a lot of people think that their view on something that should be tier four and their view is an attack on their view on Christ. So if I talk about my view of revelation, people think that's an attack on their faith. Right. on jesus and it's it's not it's not it's an interpreted it's a, it's an it's an issue of interpretation it's not a, if we both believe the same thing on christ but i have a different interpretation of the timing of his coming that's not an attack on your faith but people perceive it as the same because they don't know there's a difference it's like no that's we're interpreting this different so anyway so my step one would be this get a radius that you're willing to drive Find every church that is in agreement with tier one. That requires you to know what tier one is in your life. Then from there, I would whittle that down. Okay. What, what, which one of these agree with me the most on tier two? For example, for you, because I know you're more in line with what I'm saying, I think, and we agree more on revelation stuff. 
you would you you might really enjoy going and hearing a, a Presbyterian church speak if they're big on covenant type of teaching. Mm-hmm. And then you'll be like, wow, this is wonderful. They're teaching right through. They, they, you know, they have this viewpoint that makes sense. And then they're going to say something about infant baptism and you're going to go, huh? But you, but, but understand or at Calvinism. some point that or Calvinism. or Calvinism or Calvinism. Exactly. And you know, at some point you're going to, you're not going to, you're not, you're not going to get there and say, this is exactly where I'm at. So you got to know the hierarchy. And as far as, as far as, you know, when, you know, disagreeing with the, the message and that kind of thing, and I don't want to rabbit trail too much further on this, but if you disagree with the message, I always think of it in terms of, I agree to be governed by this church. It doesn't mean I agree with this church. It means that I agree to not cause a problem. I would leave before I cause a problem. You know, and I think if you have like, for example, at our church at True Grace, I welcome people who disagree with me. Now, I don't want them to stand up and yell and take people out to lunch and talk them to be, you know, against us. But I welcome people. You know, when you see me post stuff on YouTube, what you don't see on YouTube is as soon as I hit stop on the video, and that's all you see, I then every single time say to the people, does anybody have any comments? Does anybody have anything they want to add to this? I give people the opportunity at our church to disagree with me on the spot. Be, and here's and here's why, and I think this is why you want to find a humble pastor. And my church has heard me say this a thousand times, because if I'm wrong on the text, I want to know too. Right. I view I view our church as a group of people who desire to know what the truth is. And if, as good Bereans, because we want to be like good Bereans, if we are searching the scriptures daily to see if these things are so, then there's a. There, I guess my point is this. There's a, there's a process where you can disagree with people and still be in health. If you've got a humble pastor, a humble elder board or a humble, you know, overseers, however you want to say it, they will invite you to disagree with them as long as you're disagreeing with them on the text. And they would even say, Hey, you know, so-and-so I I know I would do this at our church. Hey, so-and-so has a different view on this and they think they have a good argument from the text. Hey, stand up and share with us what you think from the text. Don't give us your conclusions, but work through it on the text. I'd love to hear. And then I can say where I think you got wrong or, Hey, guess what? Maybe (laughs) I agree with you. I missed this one. That is an awesome church. If you can get a part of a church. So don't think you have to agree going in, but if you're part of a healthy church that welcomes searching for truth, that would be, that would be a, a a blessing or a benefit. Um, but I know, I know this, Jimmy, I know this, Jesus loves people and we have to be in a community. Yeah, we have to be. And this idea of I'm the only, you know, when you get around teachers that are saying, I figured this out, I'm the only one that knows this, that's a cult. That's cultish thinking. And they say things like, if you leave my teaching, you're never going to hear anything like this. I'll tell you right now, you probably won't learn anything new with Ken Mady. I'm trying to go, all I want to do is go to the text and explain it. I'm plagiarizing. I try to say this all the time. I try to plagiarize every sermon I do because I'm reading from the Bible. I just want to explain the text. I'm not trying to create anything new. So um, don't go to somebody who has a, has a corner on all issues. Our, our, <laughs> to bring it back to our study. Jimmy, I know that's it. You're in a tough spot there. I would just say to people, try to find a balance and pray for wisdom of finding your hierarchy of theology and asking the Lord to make you to be mature enough to say, I can go somewhere. I'm capable of eating watermelon and spitting out the seeds. I can do both. You can go and find something to be a blessing in and to say, Lord, help me know what seeds to spit out and what watermelon to be thankful for. There yeah. are, for example, there are Calvinistic churches that that's their position and they don't talk about it. Like their pastor might say, hey, we know that God's sovereign in all things. And everybody says, amen. Well, I know what they mean by that. Hey, all people are, all people are wicked and have a bent towards sin. Amen. But they're not yelling about John Calvin. You know, they're Calvinistic in their thinking, but it's not, it's not. They're clinch pit. It's not every day. It's not like you're going to James White Church, you know, or something like that. Right. I, I'm not hearing John MacArthur just constantly talking about meticulous, divine, um, you know, 
planning of God's over the number of hairs on your head and so forth. Right. So anyway, so that's another thing is are they might have it as their platform, but do they harp on it every single time you hear, or is it a balanced preaching? Yeah. Well, thanks for spending that time with us yeah. because I know that a lot of people who are watching this video have, have been with me for several years. So they know what I'm talking about. They oh, have, get it. they've put in comments over the years I've seen, I can't find anybody in my area to fellowship with. Yeah. Pray for me. Pray. So to. I've seen that have for to. four or five years now. So yeah. I'm hoping that they'll see this and it'll help them. Amen. And you, and this is a matter of prayer and wisdom, but I will say, you know, just, just to reiterate, I know what's not a good plan. What's not a good plan is to isolate yourself and to say, I figured these things out and nobody else has. So I can't be with anybody else make sure you don't get to that point our father thank you very important our um well they all won't be that long you're like that's one word <laughs> a one word i mean my goodness <laughs> so father is the next word uh, so the father is a relationship word i'm reading from the handout here it's a relationship word um it, it's also uh, we just mentioned this but it's also a hierarchy word um the father is in charge of the home in fact in the hebrew um, uh, the first, the first letter in Hebrew is Aleph and Aleph has the meaning of strong or strength or leader. And the second letter in the Hebrew alphabet is bet. You hear Aleph bet. That's where we get that, that word from, um, the Greek is alpha. So alphabet, when the Greeks took over, then it became the alphabet, the ABs, but the Aleph bet. The word, the letter bet has to do with house, um, bet, lahem. Um, uh, so bet means house, house of bread is Bethlehem means house of bread. Bet means house. So built into the Hebrew language, Aleph means leader or strong one, strong one. And bet means house. So literally the built in definition, uh, I should say, and I think everyone probably knows this, the Hebrew word for father is ab. We say, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And so, literally, by definition, A, Aleph, Bet is the strongest one in the house. It's a built-in definition by what the letters mean. So, Ab, Abba, means the strongest one in the house. So, that's the leader. That's the hierarchy of strength. And he's a father. It's, It's a covenant word. It's a hierarchy word. It's a relationship word. It's just like the, the, the way that we get to salvation in Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10. It's when we confess with our mouth, notice the Lord Jesus. That's part of being a Christian is saying that he's my master. I'm his servant. If you aren't ready to be his servant, you're not ready to be submissive to him. You're not ready to be a Christian. It's part of the definition of being a Christian is confessing that he's my master and I'm a servant. It's the Lord Jesus, he's my master. So father is that same kind of idea. I'm submissive to your hierarchy in this relationship. You're in charge. I'm not. And he's our father. Who are in heaven is the next phrase. In other words, he's, he, there's, a, there's a recognition that he's in a different realm. He's in the heavenly realm. We should we should really make a video just on that, I think, Jimmy, because I think that helps people to understand what we call the Trinity. Um, I, I prefer to use the biblical language of the Godhead, but it'll help you understand the Godhead a lot more when you understand there's different realms. He's in a different realm. He's in the heavenly realm. So Jesus entered into our realm. You know, heaven is not the top floor. Heaven is not the penthouse. Where, you know, he's on the, you know, the 85th floor is where the stars are and floor 86 is where, you know, it's not that. He's not on the top floor. He's in a different realm completely. So that means he can be screaming at you in the same room and you cannot hear him because he's in a different, maybe another word that we think of as dimension. Yeah. Maybe a good Twilight Zone word to help people. <laughs> Something like that. He's in a different realm. And so Jesus is God breaking into our realm. So when I'm praying our collective father hierarchy covenant, who's in a different realm? You're in heaven. That means he's not 
limited by my realm. He's outside of my realm. And so he's in heaven. I have in your handout, his ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55, eight, he's in a different realm. So our collective covenant relationship, father, who's in a different realm, not affected by the things that I am not limited. Hallowed be thy name. So hallowed is the verb form of the adjective holy. So holy is an adjective, but hallowed is the verb form of that. It means to sanctify or to separate. It's the action part of holiness. So I'm, I'm going to set apart his name. I'm going to sanctify his, his name. I'm sanctifying it. Why? Because his name's different than the names in my realm. Yeah, I know the guy down on the corner and, you know, I know the lady that cut me off over here and I know my boss's name and I know my mom and my dad's name. This name's different from those names. This is not just another name in my Rolodex. Good 80s reference there. This is not just, a, this is not just another name in my Rolodex. Um, some of our younger viewers will be like, what? What is that? Yeah, pretty neat. Yeah, pretty neat. But uh, it's, he's not just another, he, he's, he's different. So I'm going to sanctify, separate, hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. It's, it's separate. So I'm not talking to the guy down the road. Like, man, I've already counseled with my doctor. I've already counseled with my pastor. Okay, but prayer is not that. Prayer is communicating with somebody outside of all of these things. Not outside of our hurt, because thank the Lord, when Jesus came, it says, as we looked at this in Hebrews, that we it's not like we have a high priest that can't be touched with our infirmities, our weaknesses. He was tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. So he totally gets what we're going through. Thank, thank the Lord, that's true. But his name is separated. The name of the Father is separated from all the other names. Of course, be thy name, in and of itself, has the idea that he has a name. He's not a force. This is not a karma issue. This is not a good versus evil in the sense that I'm going to invest more time in good by prayer and my good will overcome the bad around me. No, he has a name. This is a personal being, as we talked about last time. It's a living being. He's personal. He's transcendent. He has a name. And then the very next verse, he says in verse 10, thy kingdom come. Well, my question, Jimmy, would be, and I'm reading for a handout, from where? Where, where is his kingdom coming from? This is the whole point of Christ's ministries for his kingdom to come. Well, from where? Well, from a different realm to this realm. And by the way, let's just look at the word kingdom. It's a king. That's the first part of the word king. Dom, minion, a king who has dominion. So by definition, to have a kingdom, you have to have a king who has dominion over something. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm saying thy kingdom come, well, from where? The answer is a different realm. So when we're, when we're praying, what we're doing, Jimmy, is we are, actually, we are actually inviting the heavenly realm to be invited into our earthly experience. Where we're inviting him where I normally have dominion in my home. But I'm submitting my own understanding. I'm submitting my own dominion. I'm submitting my own authority of my home and my body, my autonomy. I'm, I'm relinquishing my own authority for his. He can be in charge of my home, my finances, my belongings, my mind for his. That's, that's what we're saying here. I want his kingdom to come. And that is exactly what he defines it as. Thy will be done. See, his kingdom coming and his will be done are actually synonymous. Right. But he's reiterating so we don't miss it. If he had, if he's the king who has dominion, of course his will is done. I mean, he's the king. <laughs> you know, so his kingdom come. And then if that's the case, then his will will be done. So uh, I would just say it this way. The will of, of the king can be accomplished if his kingdom is healthy. Um, and then he says this phrase, and of course, this all comes back to thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Now this is very interesting because it goes back all the way to the garden of Eden, really, but I'll give you one clear example of Jake. Remember Jacob's ladder, the dream that Jacob had in Genesis 28, 
10 through 17, Jacob has this dream where he famously wrestles with God. And in this dream, he sees this ladder, the stairway, this ladder ascending up into heaven. And he sees angels ascending and descending on this ladder. And it's a portal. It's an access point from the earthly realm to the heavenly realm. So, you know, this is kind of like, you know, Star Trek stuff here. He, he has found a portal to another realm. That's what Jacob's Ladder is. Is that the original a, Star Trek, though, or is this like the next generation? I didn't watch, I, I didn't watch Star Trek. I should have never have said that reference. I know nothing about it. <laughs> so as soon as I said that, I don't, I don't watch sci-fi at all. If there's anything sci-fi, I lose interest. So it says, it, it, this is in a dream. Jacob wakes out of his sleep in verse 16, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. Now, here's the sad part. And I knew it not. Could you imagine, you know, getting to the end of your life? Or maybe after your life is over. And you realize the whole time the Lord was sitting right next to you, but you didn't tap into that power. So you get to the very end of this thing, and Jacob's point was, nothing, if you look at it, nothing changed for Jacob except for his awareness. It's not like the Lord showed up. He was already there. Prayer is entering the ladder. Prayer is entering into, Jesus said, I'm the door. He is the portal. Remember in, in Hebrews, when it says that Jesus, when he died on the cross, it says that Jesus died and the curtain was rent in two. And Hebrews said in that curtain, the veil is his flesh. So as he died and he was torn in two, really what was happening was the partition between the front room and the Holy of Holies was completely torn down. So you have access to the Holy of Holies. So it, it, it's as if when his flesh was torn the veil was torn at the same time so that flesh was kind of like in a sense it ne- the only way that f- that veil could be taken down is if jesus himself was torn and so when he was torn we have access to the back room so he did a lot for us to be able to access his, him surely the lord is in this place and i can say this to those that are you know that are, that are watching this the lord is in in your place too the lord is in your home you're a believer. Lord is in your home. Wouldn't it be a shame to get at the end of all your trials and to say, man, I had access to his grace. I had access to his power. I had access to the power to forgive. I had access to the power to be joyful. And I knew it not, did not tap into it the whole time. Don't let this be your story. You should be able to say, surely the Lord is in this place and I enjoy him constantly. Surely the power of forgiveness is in this place and I forgive all the time. Surely joy is in this place and I access joy constantly. That should be our story. Don't be like Jacob. It, it, he was here the whole time and I had no idea. You know, what a sad verse. Don't want that be your story. Um, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you know, we talk about this Jacob's ladder idea. Verse 11, he says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, now we've switched here. Jacob, I'm sorry, Jacob. <laughs> Jesus is, is now switching topics to, as you can tell, we, we, and we'll get into this in our general guidelines in just a moment. But as you can tell, he's going into a different topic now. It, it, we've started in verse number, for the sample prayer, we've started with understanding of who God is, where he is, of his agenda, and now in verse 11, all of a sudden we're asking, this is in Psalms, we call this supplication. Um, there's different types of prayer, right? We, we talk about these different types of prayer, but there's multiple types of prayer in this one sample prayer. And that's why Jesus gave it to us. In Psalms, we talk about supplication. You hear the word supply in supplication, supplies. Suppli- a, a supplication kind of, we, we you know, use these fancy terms. Basically, it's a prayer where you're asking God to supply something. It's a supp- you've heard my, the psalmist might say, you've heard my supplication. That basically just means you've heard me asking for supplies. And here we're transitioning into that type of prayer in this one prayer, this different style, I guess you could say, where all of a sudden 
we're no longer saying who you are, where you are in your agenda, which is verses nine and 10. And now we're saying how this functionally works for me. Give us this day, our daily bread. Okay. Now uh, for those who are following our revelation study, you've heard us say that there's two acts to revelation act one and act two, right? We finished act one already. Now we're going to start the story over again in revelation 12 through 22. And maybe this is a good time to even say, cause Jesus is really outlining it right here. Act one is talking about the story of who Jesus is and what he's accomplished. That's act one. Act two, what we're going to look at is this. Now that we know who Jesus is, and what he's accomplished, Act 2 in Revelation is saying, and how does that affect me? Now that I know who Jesus is and what he's accomplished, let's say the whole story again, but this time, let's say what it means to me. How does it affect me? That's Act 2, okay? And that's sort of how what we see in this prayer here. We see in verses 9 and 10 who God is, what he's, what he's going to accomplish, it's focused on him. And then verse 11, we kind of transitioned in, what does this have to do with me? So he says, give us this day our daily bread. Okay, so let's just, let's look at that. I I want people to just notice mostly uh, the word daily in here. This is daily bread. This this should bring us back in imagery to manna. Mm -hmm. You know, just before Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the law, all of a sudden they're given they're instructed for the first time to keep the sabbath and the and he, the instructions were are to when you see manna come the instructions were to even though you're starving only collect enough manna for that day the only exception was on friday to collect enough for the next day for two days and that's when we see the sabbath instituted in that idea um but the the the, the manna what happened is uh, jimmy they some people were scared, right? And they collected more than they needed for one day. You know, the instructions for Moses was collect, go out in the morning, collect. And he told families how much you need this for this many people. You need this for this many people. Just do that. Now you could imagine, Jimmy, if you're starving, you look over and your kids are starving and your wife is starving. What a temptation to take a little more than you might need. I mean, (laughs) It's abundant. It's like the sand of the sea. You look down and there's just whatever your favorite food is. You know, for me, it would be like there's these amazing, you know, steaks everywhere. So it's like this expensive, amazing. Hopefully we can all agree that cow tastes good. I think hopefully that's a um, whatever it is for you. Maybe you enjoy eating bark off a tree if you're not, you know, want to eat a cow. I don't know. I don't know what everybody likes. Uh, whatever you like, that food is everywhere, um, you know, and, and, and you're starving. And somebody says, okay, pick one of those. Pick one of those and that's what you can eat today. And you're going, but there's tens of millions of them and I'm starving. And somebody says, okay, just pick one. That's how prayer works. Okay. Now you might say, but wait a second. I'm going to get hungry again tomorrow. Why would I not take some for tomorrow? The answer, of course, everybody knows is tomorrow. There's going to be a fresh lot of manna tomorrow. But that requires faith for me to believe that. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. It doesn't say without feelings, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So I have to believe that I can take just enough grace for today. And also, this helps to organize my thought life on prayer. Lord, I have this big situation that's going to take years to talk through. It's going to take a long time to sort out my feelings. I'll never get over this. I'll have a scar from this. Okay, Those are overwhelming thoughts with prayer time. Lord, I've lost this person. That's not going to be reversed in this lifetime. I'm going to hurt from this forever. Okay, That's an overwhelming thought. So the Lord is showing you that there is mercy for you today. Don't sacrifice today's mercy for the fear of tomorrow. Like Jesus talked about, let the dead bury their dead. You know, the, 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 his, his point of that was, if somebody's going to make an excuse in not following me, then they're going to find a reason to not follow me. 
but his thing, his whole point was worry about today. Tomorrow will come. And when tomorrow comes that, that tomorrow will be called today. So all you have to worry about is today. This doesn't mean that the Lord is teaching us to not plan. You know, I think there's a balance here. People say, oh, so I don't have to have, you know, an IRA. That's not what this is talking about. What, but what you should say is, Lord, give me, the, this is the key here. Lord, give me the wisdom today that, you, that I need to be able to plan for my future. But I want that wisdom today. And today I want to have the security and safety that my future is okay. And then tomorrow I'm going to do the same thing. And tomorrow I'm going to do the same thing. But I'm never going to put my mind 10, 20, 30 years in the future and then worry today for that. I want daily bread. And I know tomorrow I'll have daily bread. His mercies are new every morning, not every week. So I want daily bread. In my prayer life, I have long-term issues I'm praying through, but I'm asking for those to be solved in a sense today. I'm not going to be able to get over that death tomorrow. I'm going to be hurting tomorrow. But Lord, would you comfort my heart today? Would you give me the grace and mercy I need today? Today I want healing. Not 100%. But I need what I need from you is just the grace and mercy for this day to get through this day. Lord, bring somebody in my path today I can encourage. Lord, help me to focus on your goodness today. I pray that you would strengthen me today for this need. Just be thinking about today. And then the sun will go down, sun will come up, and tomorrow you pray the same thing. And we get through this thing with his, if his word is a lamp to my feet, not a lamp to the end of the tunnel. His light, the, the word is not a lamp to the end of the tunnel or the end of the forest. His word does not light up the whole forest. His word lights up my feet. I want to know the next step, the step today. And then I'm progressing in my journey with him. You know, you talked earlier, Jimmy, about this conversation where people say they hear from God and, and you were talking about this idea of, you know, I don't know what they're talking about sort of thing, but we're starting to get into that dialogue now, right? So I want to say, I speak to the Lord, that's me praying, and his word, his word, the principles in his word is how he speaks back to me. It's like a sword out of his mouth to fight all my battles. And so the conversation, the dialogue is me opening up and saying, here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I'm asking for, for today. And like, like a mighty counselor, that's why that's one of his names. We lay on the couch in the realm of heaven, you know, as our, as our counselor, the mighty counselor, one of his names. And as you know, one of the greatest things that a counselor can do. I don't, you, you might have PhD after your name for counseling. One of the greatest things a counselor can do is just tell me what you're thinking. Right. Right. And that, that, and that's, you have all this schooling and what do we always, you know, whenever we're making a joke about it, we say, and how does that make you feel? Right. And then they talk for an hour and they go, Oh, interesting. And how does that make you feel? Right. And a good counselor shuts up. And lets the person work through things they haven't thought out loud yet. I mean, I, Jimmy, I'm amazed when I talk to folks about stuff. I'm just be quiet. Let them talk. You might ask a pointed question, you know, and no, I'm gonna, I want to dive into that a little bit more. You know, tell, tell me more about that. What did you, I, you know, uh, something I say all the time in counseling is, you know, did I hear you right? Did you say this? Repeat back their words and then just be quiet. Why? Because it, it it does something in us to be able to start admitting something. Confession with the mouth. I've had people start conversations by saying, you know, you know, I had a great childhood. Oh, this this is a wonderful thing. And then in a matter of twenty minutes, they could be yelling about something. Now I didn't even talk yet, but they're remembering a hurt that they haven't remembered for a while, and they're starting to connect dots. 
A good counselor largely is quiet. Now, in the case of prayer, he's counseling us. We're not informing him. He's counseling us. Tell me your hurt. Tell me your needs. Tell me your supplications. And then the conversation is through his word, he starts speaking to us. It's through maybe a a song that Jimmy Cooper wrote with a great lyric. And it reminds us of some biblical principle. And he starts communicating back to us. That is the dialogue. The conversation is life. In fact, in the King James, when it talks about let your conversation be known, that act, that word means lifestyle. That is the that is the dialogue. The dialogue is me speaking to him and him speaking to me through his word. So, so if you don't read the Bible, you you are missing out on hearing God speak in a lot of ways. He cannot he cannot complete the cycle. He cannot complete the cycle of the dialogue. If you don't know his word, then you cannot complete the cycle of the dialogue. You're literally muting him. So all you're going to be is basically a complainer because there's no communication. He can't even be a good counselor because he can't ask pointed questions. Part of the counselors largely be quiet and ask very, very pointed questions. You know, so can't even do that part. So daily bread, daily bread. Verse 12, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And I just have it like this in your handout. I put... um Treat us like we treat others. And I put in parentheses, yikes, right? This has to do with like what Jesus was saying. You know, in other words, if you have a problem with somebody, don't go make an offering at the temple. This is when there was a temple in the old covenant. He said, don't make an offering in the temple if, you have, if you're at odds with somebody. Leave your gift on the altar, go make it right, and then come offer your gift at the temple. Now, He says in this verse, um, forgive us our debts as we, notice the as we. Now, I'll point out a couple things here. Um, When we get to our general guidelines, I want to explain that a little bit more. But let me just say this. Jesus is instructing us to pray that we should be praying for the Father to forgive us our debts in the same manner we forgive other people's debts. Now, a lot of people can't pray that because they're bitter towards others. That's kind of the point here, too, is if our heart condition is we come and say, I'm mad at everybody. Everybody's done me wrong. Everything's gone against me. I'm bitter towards other people. And God, just what are you doing? And, um, you know, take these people out. You know, the Lord's like, whoa, hold up. That's That's not, you have to be able to say, I, Lord, I want you to forgive me in the same exact way I have forgiven other people. And if you can't pray that, then you need to forgive some people. Because this is a heart issue. Again, Jesus did not come to bring in religion. He came to bring in a kingdom. We're a family. Families cannot be at odds with each other. So I'm going to explain this a little bit more in just a moment. We get into our general guidelines here. But basically the idea is this is a heart condition. I'm not, I'm not asking for a relationship. You say, well, I can never re- reconcile a relationship with that person. That's not what Jesus said. He said to forgive them. It has nothing to do with their response. It has nothing to do with trusting them. It has nothing to do with even contacting them. You know, it has to do with forgiving them. It's a heart issue. Okay. We'll, we'll develop that a little bit more in a second. Then he says, lead us not into temptation. By the way, I'll just say one last thing on verse number 12. This is this has to do with Jesus loving people. For God so loved the world. I get very weary, um, and maybe the word is leery, I also get weary, of I don't spend too much time around people, I'll just say it that way, who have a constant negativity towards people. They say, I'm just not a people person. Well, then shame on you and change. I'm just going to be blunt. Because we're talking about, we're, listen, we, I'm putting my time into this, and I know you are too, because I love people and I want to help people. If people are watching this video because they want to be helped, then I, they have to hear the truth that if you have a habit of bad-mouthing people in general, stop doing that. So I just don't get along with people. Or people are, oh, you know people. Or they say things like, oh, people can be so annoying. Don't talk like that. Get that out of your vocabulary. Do not hang around people who talk like that. 
I'm not a people person. Can't say that. You know why? Jesus so loves the world. It moved him to die for us in our unlovely state. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I have to align my heart with him and rid myself of bitterness of anybody who's done anything to me to be able to understand the direction he wants my life to go. And if I reject that and say, I will not forgive people, then you will not experience the joy of the Lord. You won't. And you're going to be on the sidelines and wondering why nothing goes your way. And you'll become a professional victim. We cannot, cannot let that seep into our lives. We must love people. And so I just wanted to add that. We'll we'll add a little bit more meat on that in just a little bit. Okay, so the last thing he says is, lead us not into temptation. Um, I have in your handout that just says, help us not to give in to the enemy. That's that's kind of what he's saying there. Lead us not into temptation means means don't don't let me be in a situation where you know I I care about my faith. Don't let me get into a position where I'm not able to maintain faith. Like on the boat when Jesus went to them in the Sea of Galilee and said, "O oh, ye of little faith." In other words, a lot of people don't talk this way, but in other words, you can control your level of faith. You're responsible for your faith level. Jesus didn't go to them and say, oh, it just so happened when we doled out faith, you guys got a little bit. Huh, bummer. No, he says to be faithful, full of faith. That's our responsibility. And so we are responsible for our level of faith. You say, well, then how do we gain faith? We could do our own study on how we can increase our faith level. But simply stated, where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let him talk to you more. I know my kids more when I hear them talk. I know Sarah more when I hear her talk. I know God more when I hear him talk. This is not religion, it's relationship. It works just like any other relationship. You know why he chastised their faith? Because it was their fault their faith was low. Mm. I don't know if I have the faith for this. Shame on you. You control that. You're spending too much time listening to people who aren't God. So you say, well, this sounds really harsh. I don't like this. I'm trying to help people. Say, my faith is low. It's your fault. Spend more time with God. Okay? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Oh, ye of little faith was not an observation. It was a chastisement. So he says, lead us not into temptation. It means don't let me give in to the enemy, but deliver us from evil has the idea of, but rescue us from Satan and his effects. Um, Deliver us from evil has the idea of protect me from the temptation to not have faith in you. So this is a battle. And I'm going to, I got to wake up every day and, and ask for spiritual strength to remain humble before the Lord and for him to be the Lord of my life. And to ask him for an increased level of faith, to have spiritual wisdom, to know how to navigate. Things as practical as what you were saying. To be able to find a church I can be thankful for. That requires wisdom, patience, grace, maturity. Like, what a complex issue. Yeah, it is hard. I, in fact, Jimmy, I've had people that join us in person at True Grace, and they they hear, they get used to my teaching. I don't, you know, not saying it's great or whatever, but they just get used to it, and they'll say, you know, we teach things here that you know it's hard to find this combination, and and I've had people say, I don't know if I could go anywhere else now that I'm used to this, and I and I say, don't say that. <laughs> The Lord will give you what you need right, right right when you need it. We don't we haven't cornered the market on truth. There's things that I'm wrong about I don't know that I'm wrong about yet. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. I still have biases and preconceived ideas that I'm going to change on. So, you know, um anyway. Uh for thine is the kingdom has this idea that this is his kingdom. And, and and this is, again, a hierarchy term. If this is his kingdom, then I am his subject. It's this position of humility. This is your kingdom. He's saying, hey, admit to the Father, this is his kingdom. 
he's the king. He has dominion over me and over my thoughts. And then he says these two things, two different ideas. Yours is the power and the glory. So power, um, dunamis, is the idea we get you know dynamite from. The power, power is the ability to get work accomplished, just like you imagine a stick of dynamite. It's the ability to get work done. And glory, glory is an interesting word. Glory actually has to do with the idea of of controlling the 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 um. I don't want to say the thoughts of others, the impression. That's that's a good word. It's kind of controlling the impression of others. Think of the glory of God as impressionistic. Uh, in other words, God has a great amount of glory. We think of that in terms of like a lamp or a light, but that's not really the splendor glory idea. The idea of glory is that God has the ability to affect the impression of other people about him. The more ability that you have to Im- to control the thoughts of people towards you, the more the higher the glory. That's the idea of glory. Okay, um, so yours is the ability to get work done, and you have also the ability to not, not just get work done, but you have the ability to control the way people think about you, their impression of you, their thoughts of you, their observations of you. To the glory, and then it says the word forever. Now this is interesting. Because there's two ways. You'll notice the, the King James really helps us here. Because you notice that the word is not forever. In fact, the word forever does not appear in the King James. No, these are two separate words. It's the word for as a preposition. And the word ever. It's for something. It could be for today. It could be for tomorrow. And this one says for something else. It's for what? Ever. Two separate words. It's not forever. And so the word ever has to be studied here. Yours is the kingdom for something. For Tuesday? For 2024? What is it for? Well, the word here is eon. And it means age. This is the same word that's translated in the King James in Matthew 24, 3, when it talks about the end of the eon. That's why, you know, King James translates that as world and almost everybody else translates it as age. From This is the end of the Matthew 24, 3. We already know the issue. So this is that word eon. Eon has the idea... That is different. It can mean in context without end, but it can also mean, and the best way I've heard it described is this, imagine a horizon of time, okay? And there's a horizon and there is a time period that will end over the horizon, but you cannot see it. Um, It would be like if you were sentenced to prison indefinitely, but it wouldn't be for life. I know that's a kind of a strange way of saying it. If you were sentenced to prison for an indefinite period of time, but it wouldn't be for the rest of your life, you could properly use the word eon for that. How long have you been sentenced for eon? It means a period of time that you don't know when it's going to end. Now, that doesn't mean that... This is why it's interesting. Uh, Let me say this before I get into explaining this. There's another Greek word that's very similar that's called ionos. Eon, Eon has the idea of the horizon idea where it could end, but I don't know when. Uh, but Ionos has the idea of without end. And that's what we see in John 3.16. That's translated as everlasting. So Ionos is a different form of this word, and it means without end. Now, Eon can mean that, but it can also mean has an idea of like Jonah. Now this this is in the Hebrew, but I'm just giving the example. It says that Jonah was in the belly of the whale forever. Well, it was actually three days, but the word forever is used. Doesn't always mean forever, like in terms of without end. It just means Jonah is saying, I didn't know when this thing was going to end. It was over the horizon of my knowledge, but it did end, but I didn't have an awareness of when. It's it's not like somebody said, okay, Jonah, you got another 36 hours in here. He, he, so he used the word forever, meaning I uh, meaning eon. I didn't know when it was going to end, but it did come to an end. I just wasn't aware of it. This is the flavor, rather than the word everlasting, as in John 3.16, ionos. This is the word eon that is used here 
that yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory for an age. And I think the reason is it, we, we know from multiple, multiple other passages that the kingdom of God has no end as it's everlasting. So we're not, we're not suggesting that there is an end to his kingdom. His kingdom goes on forever. We know that from other passages. So then why would God use the word age here? And I think it's the idea of give us this day our daily bread. It's the idea of saying, this I know. This is your kingdom. You have the ability to accomplish whatever you want. You have the ability to change my thinking. And it's the ability that I need to apply to me today it's it's like saying this is your kingdom today and then tomorrow you know what you pray this is your kingdom today this is a prayer that's teaching us a bite-sized survival strengthen me today this is your kingdom today today this is nobody else's kingdom you know what i'm going to say tomorrow today this is your kingdom you know what I'm going to say the next day? Today, I need your provision today because this is your kingdom today. That's the focus of this prayer. Okay, so now that we've broken down this thing, let me just give you real quickly, we're, but we're pretty much through here. Let me give you five general guidelines for prayer from this sample prayer. Verse number nine, here's the, here's the general guidelines for this. I would just, and this is what you started saying at the beginning, and let me just put some um, some uh, specific words to what you already said. Start your prayer with a sense of who God is and his position. The way the Bible words it, of course, is, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So start your prayer with a sense of who God is and his position. It, it, remember, Jesus said, in like manner, in this manner. So you could say something like, Lord, you know, <laughs> I'm so glad you're on the throne today. You're so separate from all this mess. Um, Father, you are great. You know, that, that would be rewording this. It's just a, it's a heart. It's a mind uh, understanding that, that, that I have an idea of who God is and his position. So that, that'd be number one. Number two is I would confess his agenda. I'm just rewording verse 10. I'm not saying anything magical here. What's his agenda? Well, for his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. He wants the earth to progressively look more like heaven. He wants the realm of perfection and his will being done to be accomplished on, on this earth. That's why he says to Peter to, to understand that the, the things that you bind on earth are bound in heaven and things that are loosed in earth are on in heaven are loosed on earth and that. What he's saying is there the authority the authority that is already in heaven is going to be starting to be seen on earth. And so number two, I just said, confess his agenda. Lord, I, I know you want all things to be done in order. I know that you're in charge of all things. I know that you have a perfect will for my life. I know you do. And you are able to accomplish that. I know you are. So we're just talking about a general guideline for our prayer. Number three. Ask for the supplies needed for today. And notice number three is after number one and two. It's after my mind and my heart. Because I'm busy, Jimmy. I, I you know, I, I might have got a ticket today. You know, and I didn't know that the speed limit changed. And I don't can't pay that. I might have just got bad news at the doctor. And my mind is in a hundred different directions. And I got to drop off junior at soccer practice. And I got to go over here. And, oh, this person needs me. And, oh, look at these texts I'm behind on. And, man, I need to take a second when I pray to get my mind in the right position before I say, Lord, accomplish this need for me. Wait a second, who am I talking to? So start with a prayer, a sense of who God is in his position. Confess his agenda. Take a second to confess his agenda. And then thirdly, once I can get my mind calmed down, then I can say the supplies that I need for today. Then thirdly, be right with others before prayer. Now, I put this in parentheses because this is what I wanted to say earlier too. Forgiving them, whoever's hurt you, whatever situation is not going your way, forgiving them does not mean trusting them. You know, I can forgive the guy that broke into my house. Doesn't mean I'm going to give him a key. It actually means I'm probably going to fortify my house more. 
Forgiving them does not mean trusting them or getting a response from them. I might not even need to talk to them. The point is, this is a heart condition. It's not a restored relationship. It's making sure your heart is pure before the Lord and that you're not harboring bitterness towards what other people have done to you. Well, shouldn't so, this be shouldn't this be step one then? <laughs> well, know, and it, it should be. But if you prayed yesterday, you'd have had this accomplished, well, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. So it's a, it's a daily prayer. Yeah. So if 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 you if you get this out of order on your first prayer ever, I think that's okay. But tomorrow, <laughs> this should already be in, in place because we're going to pray this every day, right? Right. <laughs> so it's a constant cycle for me. Constant cycle. But you're right, though. Uh, I mean. It, in order, we should never let that ever be a thing. But if I, but if I'm in constant state of prayer, then uh, it'll already be handled. And lastly, number five is I want to ask for spiritual strength. And I think you can gather that from lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, of the glory. I think what's being said here is, you know, help me to uh, not be um, distracted by all the mess of the world. Um. And just pray for spiritual strength in some in some manner, because we're going to need that. We're going to need that spiritual strength in number five to draw a line back up to number one and start this process over again. And I'm going to consist consistently. This is going to be a cycle. So that's just a, these are general guidelines for prayer from the from the sample prayer. So anyway, do you have anything you want to add to all of that? No, this has been a great just. I know that we started this with a purpose of helping people deal with losses and things like that, but today's teaching for me was great on just prayer, you know, how to pray. And, and uh, so, I, yeah, I thank you for the way you broke that Amen. down. Amen. Well, that was really birthed out of your original statement that said that, that people that have gone through tremendous loss— and I know Sarah can say this because she specifically prayed as a little girl, Lord, please protect my dad. I don't know what I'd ever do if he died. So she has told me that a hundred times and she probably will tell me a hundred more times because it's so important for her to be able to express and to say, I specific, I never prayed for anybody else to not die. I specifically prayed as a little girl for my dad to not die. He's the only person that died young, you know, in my life. Um, and so that's a very, important thing for her that why would that person die? That's the one person I needed to not die, you know? And so, um, I think that prayer is a massive part of the grieving process of, 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 um, communicating to the Lord, our hurts. And, um, so anyway, I, I, that, that, this has been in response to what you had said that one time that, uh, that individual had specifically prayed, that these things wouldn't happen. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Ken. This has been great. And we got, we got one more in this little series, right? Our next biblical one will be expectations of ourselves. Yeah. Expect biblical expectations for ourselves. That's going to be yep. a, another big one. I, I got a feeling. <laughs>